Uh, what a privilege it is to be here to speak to you about this. And um, I'm fascinated already by the two talks that have happened and I think laid some great groundwork for what I'm about to speak to you about today. My goal with this talk is to have you rolling your eyes less at the end of the talk than at the beginning of the talk. And I've spoken on this topic a few times and I've spent some time thinking about it. And it's quite amazing the response and my own thoughts about the feasibility of flying drones sort of five years ago as, as compared to today. So I think the landscape is changing and this is getting less and less giggle worthy. Um, but you're allowed to giggle a little bit and I'm just gonna try and change your attitudes as we go through the talk. So just briefly, I'm, not, um, I'm an emergency physician from Canada. I'm on sabbatical at the University of Edinburgh. I don't receive any financial input, unfortunately, from defibrillator companies or drone companies. I, I do receive funding for my research from the Canadian government. I'm, I've uh, gotten a little Lairdall Foundation support for um, public access defibrillation optimization work in, in Edinburgh and from the government of Ontario for an unrelated project. And I have received some reimbursement from the Pulse Point Foundation, which is another um, app um, similar in nature to GoodSAM for speaking about Pulse Point um, at some conferences. So uh, pads save lives, and I think Gareth, uh, I'm not going to do that all day, Gavin, Gavin's talk this morning, um, laid the evidence base for public access defibrillation saving lives. And it's certainly been demonstrated that when you compare out-of-hospital cardiac arrest victims who receive a public access defibrillator on their chest compared to those who don't, uh, the ones that have the public access defibrillator applied to their chest tend to survive more often and better. And this is an example of someone in my community. The man on the left is a retired teacher who is playing ice hockey, as we all do in Canada all the time. Um, and he collapsed during the game, and his uh, teammates did CPR, got the defibrillator off the wall in the rink, and saved his life. And he's perfectly fine and advocates on behalf of Pulse Point in my community. And certainly that evidence and those anecdotes and case reports have percolated down into our international guidelines, committees and councils and around the world, it's generally recommended that public access defibrillation is something that we should be doing and we should be implementing. But here is the problem. 3% of out of hospital cardiac arrests have a defibrillator, a public access defibrillator used before professional responders arrived. Let's just let that sink in for a minute and think about 3%. That's not, I mean, if you did a test and you got 3%, there's something drastically wrong. Like you went to the wrong class and did the wrong exam. Um, 3% is a profound number. I mean, when we actually think about that and think about the investment in money and time and effort and marketing and messaging, and putting our own brands on the concept of public access defibrillation, for it to get used 3% of the time, I think that's a signal to us that we have to completely destruct our current concept of public access defibrillation and rebuild it. Because despite us putting more and more and more defibrillators into the community, this number is staying relatively flat. And so I think we have to stop thinking about public access defibrillation, about boxes on the wall, putting them up and hoping for them to be used, and instead start to think about the defibrillator rescuer unit. Some, because the defibrillator is not going to de defibrillate somebody all by itself. It's not going to, as of right now, walk off the wall and defibrillate someone. We need the rescuer, and I think that's what we're missing. We've been thinking about it all wrong, that we've been putting the defibrillators out there, but not thinking about the complicated bit of getting the rescuer to the defibrillator to the patient and getting it on the chest. And that's the difficult bit. So the problem um, is complicated, I think, in why we have this 3% number. Um, some basic steps in the process, when you think about it between someone collapsing, like, God forbid, me right now, and somebody actually knowing where a defibrillator is, getting it, having the confidence and the knowledge to put it on my chest and push the button. Um, there's a lot of steps. The first, of course, is proximity. Is there one nearby? I don't know. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know if there's a defib here. I heard you mention there's one up in the foyer, but is there really? No, I made it up. You made it up, right. So I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed that, that we are here at a resuscitation council meeting. And can I just see a show of hands who knows where the nearest AD is? 
Okay, good. Just make everybody move up to the front and sit along here because I'm getting nervous. But anyway, it's just, a, it's just a, a, an issue of proximity. So is there one here, first of all? Is there one being put here? But then do we know about it's here so that we can get it in a few seconds when something happens unexpectedly? And then if we go to it, is it accessible? So is it a locked security room or is there a lock on the door like you see in the picture here where it's going to put more delay into a seconds count life and death situation? Is the device ready? Is it charged? Are the pads expired? Um, and then is there somebody willing and able to take the scary step for lay people and people who have never seen a sick person before to actually do it? So when you start thinking about all these places where this could go wrong, the 3% number starts to make sense. And we've already seen this paper go up um, on the screen. And this is a really useful analysis based on the literature out there from Chris Smith in the room and Gavin Perkins um, and team who really thoughtfully dissected out what we know about the barriers. And you've, you've seen the page in Gavin's presentation earlier today. Uh, it's complicated, and there are lots of ways this could go wrong. Just one example of the proximity issue. So Toronto is a city that has for many years tried to put in a robust public access defibrillation program. Um, and on the map there, you can see cardiac arrests in red, historical ones, and registered AD locations in blue. And there are a number of ADs you can see in the highlighted line of the, of the chart there. You can see that despite all that work, there's only 23% of historical cardiac arrests that are covered with the current public access defibrillators. Um, and that's with you know, over a, over a, th a thousand and a half um, defibrillators in a, in a relatively compact city. And, and I think we have to recognize that just putting static fixed public access defibrillators out there has limitations. We, we've done some work with an engineer in Toronto who I'll, I'll speak more about later. His expertise is using optimization modeling to help us figure out how to place defibrillators better. And one of the really interesting realizations we had was that when we play with this model and kind of simulate putting more and more and more and more defibs into Toronto and looking at how well they cover the cardiac arrest, that top black solid line is 25,000 public access defibrillators. And along the bottom there is if you increase this theoretical idea of how, how far does one defibrillator cover? Like, how far away are you covering a cardiac arrest? And you can see there that even when you put 25,000 of these things in Toronto, if you consider the effective range to be 100%, it meets somewhere just in between 70 and 80%, which is not perfect. And that's an amazing financial investment to get less than perfect coverage. So I think even in the best case scenario, if we blanket the planet with defibs, you're still going to have a problem if they're fixed on the wall and not associated with a person. So that is what allows us to think about crazy ideas like putting wings on defibrillators. And this is a picture of putting a defibrillator onto a unmanned aerial vehicle, otherwise known as a drone. And this is being driven not by medicine and by the resuscitation community, but as you all know, I'm sure, um, there are large corporations around the planet working very hard with very smart, well-paid people, mostly in Southern California, um, to fly things to us. So um, in, in some places now, I can go on my phone, order a packet of printer paper, push the button, and one of these things will drive and drop it in my backyard. Um, this is another Amazon vehicle, which is sort of a fixed wing rotor combo. So it's like a Harrier jet. It can take off. Um, straight up and down and then fly like a fixed wing and float down into your backyard. You put a little um, thing in your backyard that the drone can actually see and it lands right on the spot, drops your package and takes off again back for the next delivery. And these are not pretend anymore. These are actually doing flights and dropping off things. Domino's Pizza, just because it's, it's too hard to get up and walk to the pizza shop. Domino's Pizza says that it's having trouble um, hiring delivery drivers for their pizza operation. And so they've invested lots of money into research around drones and other land-based robots to deliver your pizza. And I think we, should, we will all be terribly, terribly embarrassed if Domino's figures out how to deliver a pizza in three minutes and we can't do it with defibrillators. So I feel like we have to keep up, otherwise we're going to look silly. 
So now moving to medical applications of drones and other um, unmanned vehicles. This is um, a company called Zipline, and they are delivering blood and medicines in resource uh, poor areas of the world where road infrastructure is often unusable. So um, there's a problem with vaccines and blood delivery in parts of Africa, and this company has fully embedded there and is operating a business delivering um, blood and medications. This is a fixed-wing drone. It launches off this catapult, and then it parachutes the blood down into near the clinic where it's needed, and, and they um, have an online order and delivery service that is working very well. And then moving from non-cardiac arrest applications now to cardiac arrest, there are a number of prototypes um, in different stages of development of drones dropping AEDs to patients. This is the first one that I ever saw. I think this is in Germany um, with a simulated arrest here, dropping an uh, AED by a parachute. Um, this is another one um, from Scandinavia, a sort of drone ambulance where the, the AED is actually part of the drone itself, and the drone also has uh, th three-way communication between dispatch, responding paramedics, and the bystander um, to help coaching with use of the defibrillator. And this is the most recent picture I found um, from Sweden and the Karolinska Institute, um, where they've actually been able to publish a pilot study of um, taking that, uh, that drone, putting it on top of a fire station, and then looking at historic historical cardiac arrests, so actual locations, and then flying the drone with the defib, dropping the defib off at the actual scene of the cardiac arrest that happened in the past, and then comparing that to ambulance response times for the actual arrest that, that occurred. So it's definitely not rocket science, but I think the fact that it got in, in JAMA here is a, is a hint that at least some people are starting to take this idea a little more seriously than in the past. From in, in that study, that little pilot, um, the median time for delivery to these 18 arrests around this fire station uh, in a rural area was five minutes and 22 seconds versus the median ambulance response for these arrests was 22 minutes. Now, both of those times are not great, um, so five minutes is a long time for a defib, but I think it's a proof of principle, proof of concept, that you can fly a drone and deliver an AD and beat your local EMS services. This is some work that our group did now. Um, it was actually before this study, but logically it's kind of the next step. If you can do it, so if it's technically possible, and you can fly the defibs, the question is how would you design a system? And is it, is it feasible to, and cost-effective to think about blanketing a, a region with drone bases and drones and pilots and all the rest of it. This was the first step at, at getting into this. Um, but this is now getting out of, this is not a medicine problem anymore. I mean, we know what the medicine is. It's defibrillation. We're getting into the, pro, into the realm of engineers and urban planners and social psychologists and um, t technology developers, really. And so we've partnered in Toronto with this gang here. Tim Chan is on the left. He's a very smart uh, engineer who was very good at maths in school, and now he's applying it to the problem of, of drones and ADs and how best we can place them in the community. We have a drone engineer there and one of their students. We all ganged up, and Tim taught us about this, um, which I don't know about you, but um, it's pretty clear to me what that says. Um, but optimization modeling is where you take um, an equation um, and you, you kind of say, we're going to maximize something with the following conditions. So in our case, it was maximizing the cardiac arrest covered by an AD placement on a drone. Um, and subject to, we have this many to place, and we're going to say, we mean covered if there's an arrest within 100 meters. We use that basic model to publish a paper on sort of where we put static defibrillators in the community. But then we use the same modeling technique in this paper to say, OK, if we want to beat the ambulance by one, two, or three minutes, what would that mean as far as where we would need to put bases for drones, how many drones at each base, all based on what we know about how drones fly. So that's why we had the drone engineer there to tell us how long it takes to ascend, how fast you can fly based on what kind of weather it is, how, how long it takes to descend, and the change over time between jobs. So again, you know, the dots on these map maps with the circles around them were where we would put drone bases with certain conditions set. 
So I think the details in this paper of how many drones and where they were was not important. It was the concept of using data to guide future implementation and to show that we could sort of plan this out and what kind of benefits you might get. So it might help in the future to figure out whether this is health, health uh, cost beneficial or whether it's just too silly and expensive to even consider. More uh, recently, with the same group out of Sweden, I'm just thinking about if you have a drone, is it cost effective just to use it for cardiac arrest? Or why, might we be able to share services? Could we put epinephrine on the drones? Um, could we put uh, neuroprotective agents that in the future are discovered to be helpful for cardiac arrest but are too expensive to have on every ambulance? So we could use it as a kind of shuttle for um, other materials and things for other emergencies in addition to delivery of, of defibrillators. This was another use where they looked at simulating a drowned victim in a 100 by 100 meter area of water, submerged a dummy, and basically compared a drone pilot and one assistant and one lifeguard who would go out looking for the drowning victim after the drone had spotted it versus a team of 14 rescuers doing the traditional standard way to search for a submerged drowning victim. And as you might imagine, the drone that went up to 60 meters and had a quick look around was able to spot the, the partially submerged mannequin very, very quickly, um, much more quickly than the team of 14 coming through the water um, and was able to send a rescuer out to immediately the site where the drone was hovering. So it was just a demonstration of maybe we can think about drones for cardiac arrest, but it might have other applications in, in rescue and, and emergency services. There are tons of challenges and questions, and that's why the eye rolling is justified. I think that anyone working in this area has to start out as a staunch skeptic that there's no way this is going to work. And also to avoid the attraction, it's kind of a sexy, techy, cool thing that you know often gets me invited to speak at things like this because it's new and kind of um, a bit risky and, and innovative. But I think if you're really going to get serious about this, um, you have to make sure that you're solving a problem with technology and not using technology to kind of find a problem, if you know what I mean. It, it's, it's tempting to just get into drones because they're cool, but I think we really need to think about what would it actually take for drones to be effective? Do we need drones to get there in a minute for them to be worth it? Because if they get in there in five minutes, if it's, is it really going to make that much difference? Um, so there's all the logistics about how you work that into an ambulance service. Pilots, you know, would they be hired by the ambulance service? What would their job flow look like? Um, the return trip, how to get the drone back. Is it going to fly back on its own, in which it will reduce its range out? Or is it going to be picked up by the ambulance crew and taken back to base? Um, how to, this is a big one. How to interact with the receiving bystanders. So lay people, bystanders are often elderly, um, just given the demographics of cardiac arrest. Um, and may not be as tech savvy as the younger generations. How's everybody going to feel when there's this robot basically landing on their grass and they're already panicked about their loved one being unconscious and we're already having trouble figuring out whether we can coach them to do CPR? How's this going to mess all that up? Is it going to take away from CPR? Because now there's a drone landing in the backyard. So we have to be careful about all of that. Um, I, will, I will stop there and just say keep your eyes on the sky um, hopefully these things won't be knocking people on the noggin when they're in the midst of doing CPR uh, and causing other problems, but I think it's, it's worth it to start thinking about it. Thank you very much.